thank you so much for that generous introduction and for the Enoch Pratt Free Library for having me. I'm such a fan of this institution and have spent many happy hours here uh, with my kids in the children's section especially. Also, I bring my students here to use the Maryland Room and uh, we always find wonderful resources, uh, um, original sources, primary sources up there. Um, I'd also like to say that tonight, you are going to hear some of my original research from Baltimore 68, but a lot of this lecture is based on the research of other scholars. And so, as we go through, I'm going to show you the pictures of their book covers, and I hope that you will look them up afterwards and look at um, the good work that they have done. And I'd also like to emphasize that Baltimore 68 was a group project, and uh, my article was co-written by Deborah Weiner, and so a lot of collaborative work goes into the study of Baltimore, especially at the University of Baltimore. So thank you very much for that. And, um, we will get started with the talk that I'm calling tonight, Such Are the Customs of Baltimore. I'm a little bit hesitant to use that term here at the universe, at, um, at Enoch Pratt Free Library because that was actually published as a decision of the trustees of Enoch Pratt Free Library when they decided not to allow African Americans to come into their library school because they were afraid that the white librarians would not want to work alongside African American librarians that they train, and they said, such are the customs of Baltimore. So as we move through the slides tonight and the information starting way back, we'll see how those customs have changed and how segregation was not always the custom of Baltimore and how it doesn't have to be the custom as we move into the future. So this first slide is a picture that I took about three blocks from my house. It's at the corner of Gilmore and Fayette Street. I live in Union Square. I've lived there for 15 years and raised two sons there. Uh, they both went to city public schools and then um, City College High School. So they're both City College Knights. Um, this is on Gilmore Street that runs by the side of it, and that's about a mile from the place where Freddie Gray was arrested, taken into police custody, and later died in police custody. So we all know the night of April the 27th, after peaceful protests for a number of weeks, um, on April 27th, in the afternoon, many of the neighborhoods on the west side of Baltimore, some on the east side, erupted. And it was like a flare had gone up over our city and suddenly these neighborhoods were illuminated and the entire nation and some parts of the world took notice of the conditions that existed in West Baltimore neighborhoods. And they noticed also that there was a big contradiction between the gleaming in a harbor and the neighborhoods that Freddie Gray had lived and died in. And a lot of people started talking about their two Baltimores and how did this happen. And I started getting calls from people uh, all over. Al Jazeera called me first and said, you've done work on Baltimore 68. How does this affect, how does this connect to Baltimore in 1968? And a lot of people said, well, certainly these neighborhoods, a lot of them are the same neighborhoods. And it turned out that our research, the article that Deb Weiner and I wrote, had looked at three Baltimore neighborhoods, the business districts affected after 68, and two of those streets happen to be West North Avenue and Pennsylvania Avenue. And you know the intersection is where the CVS burned and that was all over the um, television news. So I had to say, well, I don't think that we can say 1968 was the beginning of the decline of Baltimore. There was already a lot going on in Baltimore that made the, um, that made the neighborhoods erupt in 1968. So tonight I'd like to go back much further to the very beginnings of our city and talk about what was set in place that created neighborhoods like Sandtown Winchester. And again, tonight I don't want to go from the proposition of what's wrong with these neighborhoods, I want to ask what's wrong with the system that can create neighborhoods like this. So you can see this map of Baltimore, uh, well, map of the eastern seaboard. Baltimore is the blue dot over there. And Baltimore, I think this map makes pretty clear, 
benefited from its geographical position from very early on because it is so much further west than any of the other ports on the eastern seaboard. So it was the westernmost deep water port, which meant that you could save a lot of money by staying on the water if you were delivering goods to America or you were taking goods from America to other places. So people could go all the way up the Chesapeake Bay, come to Baltimore, and they could, um, they could move their goods more, for a longer time on water than they would the terrible roads of the early republic. So Baltimore tried to be a tobacco port uh, from its beginnings. It didn't really take off as a tobacco port. And once tobacco farms started changing over to wheat farms, farmers started sending their wheat, Baltimore started processing wheat, and that became a real economic engine for Baltimore. In fact, Baltimore was the first boom town in America. We think about the western cities being boom towns around gold and mining, but Baltimore was actually a boom town because of all of this trade going in and out of the port, especially wheat and flour. And this is an early map of Baltimore from about 1801, and you can see the neighborhoods around the water. Um, this is Fells Point over here. This is what they call the basin then. We call it the Inner Harbor. This is South Baltimore. This is kind of downtown now. And a really important uh, element of Baltimore downtown was this river, the Jones Falls. We barely know it's a river because 83 goes over it now. Um, but that was a very important aspect of separating Fells Point from the rest of Baltimore City, Baltimore town. There were a lot of workers who lived along the water, and they needed to live within walking distance of the water because there was no public transportation. It was very expensive to own a horse and a carriage and stable the horse, and so most people walked to work. And that meant that there was a lot of concentration of people living in Fells Point and living in this uh, part of Baltimore near the waterfront. Now, a great book that you can read about this early period in Baltimore is Freedom's Port, the African-American Community of Baltimore from 1790 to 1860 by Christopher Phillips. And Christopher Phillips talks about the African-American community, which um, was, in fact, the largest free people of color, the community that was the largest free people of color group in America. And those people were living alongside African Americans who were also enslaved. So it kind of creates a complicated social society and a complicated economic society as well. As we all know, the most famous enslaved person who lived in Baltimore was Frederick Douglass, and he lived in Fells Point, and he worked in Fells Point eventually as a caulker. Uh, that was a, high, a skilled job. It paid well. There were a lot of African Americans who were caulkers, and you know they, they're putting caulk in between the um, boards of a ship to keep it watertight. And Frederick Douglass learned to read in Baltimore, and he tricked the little boys of Fells Point into teaching him how to write. And then he escaped from Baltimore, uh, disguised as a sailor, escaped on a train. So Frederick Douglass was very typical of how a lot of enslaved people got to Baltimore. Um, out in the rural areas on the eastern shore, the, um, the agriculture didn't need as many slaves as they had when tobacco was the main crop. And so they started taking their slaves to other places and renting them out to people who needed more industrial type work. So Frederick Douglass moved from the Eastern Shore, was sent by his um, owner, and he lived with the Alds in um, Fells Point, and he was rented out in these different, work, uh, different jobs around the shipyard. So he would earn money every single week, and then he would have to turn the money over to the people that he was living with and eventually to his owner uh, because that was, that was the, the people that he was rented from would turn the money over to the owner, and that was the arrangement. And that's what made it very stark to him because he was working right alongside people who were earning money and they could keep it, and he couldn't keep that money. And so that made the realities of slavery very stark to him. 
We also have a large population of freed people, and this woman we know, uh, Thomas Wood, painted this free woman of color who was working as a market woman in Baltimore um, in the 1850s. So that was a typical job that uh, a woman could have and an African-American woman could have. And just to lay this out, one of the customs of Baltimore in this early era was that there weren't any jobs that were closed to African-Americans except carpenters on ships. So every other job was open to African-Americans. There weren't any jobs in Baltimore that only African-Americans had. Uh, the book Scraping By by Seth Rockman talks about people who went and picked up manure off the street, people who worked the mud machine that was dredging up the harbor. All of those people were white and black people, enslaved and free people, all working similar jobs. And that was the reality in Baltimore for a number of decades. Another thing that people don't really realize about antebellum Baltimore is that it was not segregated residentially. So this map comes from Freedom's Port and is, uses information from Baltimore City directories to chart where African Americans lived in Baltimore City. So it's kind of the same map you can still see here. It's a little, this is the, this is the water here. This is the Inner Harbor. This is uh, Fells Point, this is downtown, and this is the Jones Falls. So you can see from this map that African Americans are living in every single ward of the city of Baltimore before 1860. Now they may be living in every single ward, but they weren't living in all the same kinds of houses. Um, a lot of times they were living around a church, so some of those, um, those conglomerations where the dots are bigger meant that there might be a church there. And the African American church became really important during this period because it was one of the few institutions where African Americans could take leadership roles and have control over their own meetings. Um, the churches, especially the Methodist churches, started out, Methodist churches uh, were anti-slavery. And in Baltimore, the Methodist churches had both black and white members before the Civil War. And then as the, centuries, the century progressed, they started in the Methodist church to say that, yes, the black parishioners could be in the church, but they had to take communion after the white parishioners. And so that was very galling, obviously, to a lot of the black members. And they moved their membership to new all African-American churches. Now, some of those churches were still the ministers would be white. The leadership could be white. But in other ones, African-Americans took the full responsibility for all of the operations of the church. And so a lot of those churches uh, not only ran churches and um, had social activities for their parishioners, but they also ran schools because one of the realities of African-American life in Antebellum, and Baltimore was that if you were a property owner and if you paid taxes, your taxes went into the system that funded the schools, but there were only schools for white children. There were no schools for black children, so you had to pay taxes to sponsor schools that your children could never attend. So a lot of these churches started running schools. Um, white churches did that too, but especially African-American churches. Now, as I said, um, people are living in the same areas, but they're not living in the same types of houses. So if you're from Baltimore, you may be familiar with the alley house. And the alley house, are they're usually smaller, uh, the houses on main streets in Baltimore are usually row houses in this old section. Usually they have three stories and are three bays wide, so a door and two windows, or three windows across. Um, those are on the main streets. On the alley streets, as you can see, these um, houses are much smaller, usually two rows, sometimes two and a half, and they're usually just two bays wide, so very, very narrow. And this is where African Americans lived through much of the 19th and 20th century. 
immigrant groups also moved into these, um, these houses as well. So sometimes if African Americans were domestic workers, they could live right around the corner from the people that they were working for on the bigger houses that were on the main streets. The city did not do very well with uh, public accommodations for the alleys. They piped water into the city, into a lot of the main streets in the 1880s, but they did not connect running water to the alley houses. Uh, Baltimore was very slow in creating a sewer system. They didn't start the sewer system until after the Great Fire of 1904, and even then they did not connect the alley houses. So the alley houses have privies, they have water pumps, and they have um, poor sanitation in a, lot of, in a lot of situations well into the 20th century. Another area that becomes contentious for African Americans before the Civil War is um, employment. And even though people had been working the same jobs, whether they were black or white, those start to break down, that, that kind of um, encompassing um, employment starts to break down before the Civil War. And famously, Frederick Douglass writes about a time when Irish workers come and challenge the black caulkers in Fells Point and to the point of violence to try to drive them out of that industry. Um, a, a visitor from England comes in the 1850s and he says that he was in Baltimore 10 years before and everybody that moved everything around um, all the stevedores had been black. And he says 10 years later, they're all white and they're European immigrants. And you can just see that whole changeover in a lot of different kinds of types of employment. This quotation from a visitor says, whenever the interests of the white man and the black come into collision in the United States, the black man goes to the wall. It's certain that wherever labor is scarce, there he, the black man, is readily employed. But when labor becomes plentiful, he is the first to be discharged. So that's going on here before the Civil War as well. Another uh, thing to know about the African American community before the Civil War is the way that incarceration was used differently for black prisoners than it was for white prisoners. So there's actually a different set of rules that developed as to sentences for African Americans. So a white person might be sentenced to go to jail for a certain amount of time. A free black person could actually be sentenced to go back into slavery. If you, it could be for a term. Um, if you committed arson, you had a choice. You could be hanged or you could be sold into slavery for life if you were African American. Of course, that, was no, that wasn't an option for, for white people who were accused of the same crimes. So here's our free woman of color again, and let's just see what her life would be like before the Civil War. She's in a community that is more numerous than any free African American community in the rest of the country. Um, she has the ability to work. She has the ability to go to a church that she might be able to have some leadership roles in. But her position is very tenuous. Her husband is, hasn't been able to vote since the early 1800s when the vote was removed from African Americans here. Uh, she may earn money, but she may have spent some of that money in trying to buy her relatives out of slavery. And one of the things that we know about the early days here is that you can look into who lived with whom, and you'll find that there are free people and enslaved people living in the same houses, in, uh, especially in Fells Point, all over Baltimore. And a lot of times it seems that people have bought their relatives and have kept them enslaved because they were actually safer as property of the householder than they were as free people, especially the children. So can you imagine that? You've spent all this, you've worked to raise all this money, and instead of buying a business, instead of buying a house, instead of buying property, you have to buy your relatives. And that is a burden that other immigrant groups did not have to bear. After the Civil War, a lot of freed people came to Baltimore, 
and they um, increased the number of African Americans here. It was actually kind of a tricky economic time. There were ups and downs, but eventually in the century, Baltimore's economy moves from moving things around processing flour into um, in more industrial. They're actually making things. And there were more jobs for people, and so it still became a magnet for people who wanted to work here. So people still kept coming to Baltimore. Baltimore has three annexations during the 19th century, and it grows in 1817, 1888, and then finally reaches its final size in 1918. And it, with each of those annexations, new areas open up, and they're able to build new housing in those areas. Baltimore is really conservative about the kind of housing they build. They continue to build those row houses for years and years and years. But that's a lot of construction jobs, and a lot of African American people were um, eager to do those jobs. So on this next series of maps, every time you see that little stop sign, that's going to be the intersection of Pennsylvania Avenue and West North Avenue, where the unrest was this, a this past April. So we'll be talking about the history of that area and, and, what, and, um, and how those neighborhoods around that uh, intersection developed. You can see the uh, arrow is pointing up to Druid Hill Park. And in 1860, the Baltimore City um, government decided to, that they were going to buy an estate, and they were going to turn it into the premier park of um, Baltimore. And so that becomes Druid Hill Park, and it becomes the place that elite families want to move. And so the direction of that red arrow is a lot of people who had been living down Monument Square was the first elite neighborhood, and then Washington, um, Mount Vernon, where the Washington Monument is, was another elite neighborhood. And then people start moving, people of means start moving up. So that's the direction that you'll see throughout um, much of the late 19th and early 20th century. And the story of the Northwest Baltimore right below the park is um, chronicled very ably in Not in My Neighborhood by Antero Pilatella. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with his book, and I'm just going to show you some, some information from it and also some images from it. So this map is from his book, and you can see down here, interestingly, this is Johns Hopkins University, the first location of Hopkins. A lot of people, it's hard to find because they're not many buildings that are left from Hopkins down there. But when Hopkins started and located right down here, um, a lot of the professors moved around there. The students lived in boarding houses. You had a lot of people, professionals associated with Hopkins, living in nice um, houses. And a lot of um, fine houses get built along Utah Place and in these neighborhoods. Hopkins announces in 1901 that they are going to move up to Homewood. And so people know that all that professional um, habitation is going to leave. And so a lot of that leaves a lot of houses. Once they announce, people start leaving. And then once they're gone, there are a lot of houses in this area. And so uh, you can see all these synagogues. A lot of Jewish families move into this area as well. And then African Americans come and move, especially on this side of McCullough Street. W. Ashby Hawkins is an African American lawyer, and he decides that he is going to buy this house on McCullough Street, 1834 McCullough. And McCullough was the official border between black West Baltimore and white West Baltimore. So you all, you know, Bolton Hill over here, uh, this was kind of a Confederate. Uh, neighborhood. Former Confederates lived in Bolton Hill. Uh, Mr. Marbury, who had been Robert E. Lee's chief of, chief of staff, lived there. The, con one of the Confederate monument is right up here. So that was a very white Confederate neighborhood. Um, there, was Jewish, there were Jewish people who lived in this area and then African Americans over here. And this was this understood, McCullough Street was this understood line that was going to separate white people and black people. Black people were supposed to stay on the other side of it. But he buys this house, and it's going to be an investment house, a speculation house. And he rents it to his law partner, McMechan, um, who had graduated from Yale Law School. So he's also an attorney, a professional person. 
he moves into the neighborhood. Um, he's quickly followed by a postal worker, two teachers, and the neighborhood thinks and says that this is a Negro invasion into the neighborhood. Um, one day, a neighbor, a white neighbor, walks across the street to one of the black neighbors and says, you don't belong here, and the black neighbor says, get off of my property. And the white person is so incensed, he goes to a police officer and says, this man just told me to get off his property. And the police officer said, right, he has the <laughs> right to do that. And the man says, well, there ought to be a law against that. And so he goes to a city councilman, and the city council of Baltimore creates an ordinance that is going to divide the city into white blocks and two black blocks, or colored blocks, as they were called then, Negro blocks. So this is the New York Times, Christmas Day of 1910. And this is when the ordinance and the details of the ordinance were made public to the rest of the nation. The way this law worked was that if you wanted to move onto a block, you had to determine whether the majority of the residents on that block were black or white. And if you were a black person, you could not move on to a majority white block. And if you were a white person, you could not move into a majority black block. This applied to every block in the city. And if you were a developer, you were supposed to determine as you began your development to what was, was your development going to be a black development or a white development. So you might think that everybody would be horrified in the rest of America with this new law, um, this new ordinance, but in fact, many cities thought it was a wonderful idea and adopted ordinances modeled on uh, Baltimore's. Baltimore's was the first in the nation. This was overturned in 1917. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled that Louisville, Kentucky's law was uh, unconstitutional, and so that applied to Baltimore as well. And yet, a lot of the effects of this still remained um, even after 1917. So this is the Baltimore Sun uh, uh, classified ads from 1921. And as you can see, throughout most of the century, um, you had, if you were looking at real estate, it was very clear whether colored tenants were supposed to live there or white tenants were supposed to live there. <clears throat> After a black block, white block ordinance was overturned, many neighborhoods turned to a different mechanism to try to keep um, their neighborhoods homogenous. And one tool for that is the residential restrictive covenant. And uh, famously, Roland Park uh, had these covenants. Uh, Homeland has these covenants. Guilford has these covenants. Uh, many of the most um, elite uh, sought after suburbs were established with these covenants. Northwood, original Northwood also has them. Um, Roland Park, many of you know, is very different from the rest of Baltimore. Baltimore has that relentless grid pattern. Roland Park has um, more hills and streams and little uh, pathways. This is a, a block that all the houses back onto a common field area. And these were, the covenant said that if you uh, bought the house, you had to say, sign a covenant that said you could not sell it to a black person. In Roland Park, Guilford, and Homeland as well, it also said you could not sell it to a Jewish person. So this is the same time that the transportation system is spreading out all over the region and is allowing development in other places. And so you can see where a lot of the um, streetcar lines were going, and so developments were further out. Uh, a lot of the suburban developments adopt the pattern of residential covenants, and you have um, the suburban areas also off limits to African Americans. There were two new developments that actually had residential covenants keeping whites out of them, and that was Morgan Park near Morgan State and uh, Wilson Park, and W. Ashby Hawkins lives in Wilson Park. He, that's where he actually lived. So that leaves the west side, uh, where we saw the first um, house coming over McCullough Avenue. A lot of those white and Jewish families simply leave. And Baltimore does not have a history. It has some instances of 
um, you know, harassment of people of color who move into white neighborhoods, but mostly the pattern of Baltimore, the custom of Baltimore is that white people will just leave that neighborhood and, and will have a pretty quick racial turnover. Um, one of the families that uh, thrives in West Baltimore is Thurgood Marshall's family, and uh, his extended family lived there. His mother was a teacher. He grew up there. Um, and Thurgood Marshall's family is an example of kind of the economic diversity that existed in this segregated neighborhood throughout a lot of the 20th century. So even though there wasn't racial diversity, there was economic diversity there. This is the Royal Theater along Pennsylvania Avenue, always a good show. And um, this was a real mecca for African and African American entertainment. Entertainers who were coming all along up and down the East Coast would always stop here. Uh, this was always uh, this was also a place where African Americans could shop, could try on the clothes, and that was something they could not do in the downtown department stores because of the customs of Baltimore. So some of the segregation activities that were going on downtown outside of Old West Baltimore, we recently saw the controversy over tearing down Reed's drugstore, and that was um, we were able to tell the story of the sit-ins at Reed's to try to integrate that, that um, lunch counter, and uh, a lot of those downtown businesses were just not open to African Americans to even sit down and have lunch. There was a series of bathhouses created by um, the Walters, and they were segregated. The uh, African-American bathhouse uh, was built in 1908 in Old West Baltimore um, and uh, was, was existed, but it was, they, African-Americans couldn't go to the other bathhouses around town. Uh, Johns Hopkins had segregated wards. This is the gynecological ward of Johns Hopkins. They famously also had um, segregated blood supplies at Hopkins. So jobs were also um, designated by custom and by preference as to who you might uh, advertise that you wanted to hire for a certain job. Now this is also, if you go through the Classified ads, you'll also see that this is um, very specific, whether they want men or women. So this is a gendered operation, too. But you can see here, uh, we want several colored porters here, laborers colored. This warehouse is going to uh, hire truckers who are white or colored. Chauffeurs, they definitely want a white man, and they want him to be married, uh, as so along with that one. So this is from 1923. As the century progresses, um, the housing stock in those areas gets uh, obviously older. It gets more deteriorated. If there is a limited uh, amount of places that African Americans can live, those houses are going to get more crowded. And so this is the redlining map from 1937. The federal government, the um, Homeowners, Homeowners Loan Corporation, creates these maps for every city in the country. And they used the, um, they talked to the people who were the real estate agents and the bankers who were already operating in that, um, in that town to find out where they were willing to lend and where they weren't. And the way that this works is the green areas are the most highly desirable in the places that was safest to, loan, to, um, to lend. So Holman and Guilford, because they're newer, um, are green. And this is Ten Hills and Hunting Ridge out here. The blue areas were um, oh, probably a little older. Parts of Roland Park are blue because the, that housing stock had gotten older but are still desirable. In Baltimore, um, a lot of Catholic families lived up in this northeast area, and that was blue. These yellow areas are transitional areas, which often means transitioning from the white race to the black race. And then in this area, in the inner city, redlined. Um, those were going to be a dangerous investment for a bank, um, and it was not encouraged for people to, um, to make um, loans there. This gets really put in place by the FHA after World War II. So uh, these did exist. 
uh, but the FHA is really the ones after World War II that they are going to not insure places that are in their versions of these redlining maps. Here are two pretty, uh, I'm sorry it's light because it's hard to see these slides, uh, but it's unusual to see the interiors of two African American homes between the wars. And you can see these are all people lying here sleeping in the living room. People are just crowding into these areas because the neighborhoods where African Americans could move was so limited. This crowding also creates a real health, public health issue. And, um, this block off of Pennsylvania Avenue was known as the lung block because of the high incidence of tuberculosis. Um, it was seven times this, in this block what it was in the rest of Baltimore City. So we come out of the Depression with World War II, and this is also another boom time for Baltimore. And the war industries bring a lot more people to Baltimore as well, but also bring a lot of economic activity to Baltimore. And Sparrow's Point is um, the epitome of that. Sparrow's Point at one time after the war was the largest steel mill in the world. It employed 35,000 people. And uh, it's, it's, it's at a height of activity during World War II. Um, but the customs of Baltimore continue in World War II, um, after World War II, in the deep segregation that takes place, not only between blacks and whites, but even in, within ethnic communities. So this is a, a man who was interviewed for our project in 1968, and he is an Irish Catholic um, person who grew up in Pigtown in southwest Baltimore, and he says... Knowing what streets not to go down was handed down much like the secrets of families. It's part of what we do in America. It's part of the unspoken racism rather than the outspoken blatant racism. Networking was essential to keeping it white, keeping it Catholic, and keeping it safe. And he says in the rest of his interview, not only did he not talk to other non-Catholics, his parents didn't even want him talking to German Catholics or Italian Catholics. He had only to talk and do business with Irish Catholics, and that's who he went to school with, that's who he went to church with, and that's where he was told to shop. So Baltimore, by this period, even though it's booming economically, even though there are lots of jobs, even though people are pouring in here, it's really segregating itself in a lot of tiny little neighborhoods that are very, that are very balkanized. So speculators, real estate speculators, play on this tendency of Baltimoreans to see themselves as part of a group and to know who should be there and who should not be there is the practice of blockbusting. In Ed Orser's book, Blockbusting in Baltimore, the Edmondson Village story talks about the neighborhood to the, on the west side of Baltimore and how that neighborhood uh, changes very rapidly from an all-white neighborhood to an all-black neighborhood. And he interviews people who lived in, um, on, you know, in Baltimore and on the west side in the late 1950s and the early 1960s. And they talk about real estate agents would send black people into neighborhoods, sometimes to look at a house that was for sale, sometimes just to walk around in the sidewalks. And just the presence of black people in that neighborhood would cause white people to put their houses up for sale and often put them up for a lower amount of money. Um, then the speculators can come in, buy that house, flip it and sell it to an African-American for a higher amount of money because they really wanted to get out of those neighborhoods that were so crowded and with the older housing stock and often at terms that were very, um, because banks weren't lending money to African-Americans, the, the real estate people were making those loans themselves and so a lot of times even if you bought the property, because you couldn't pay the exorbitant interest rate, that property would revert to the seller, uh, who was the real estate agent. So this was really a pernicious practice that, that plays on that idea of, of who's supposed to be here, who's not supposed to be here, um, that custom of Baltimore. So between 1940 and 1960, um, African Americans, this is, a, this is the majority African Americans in these large and these dark areas, uh, this was their area between the wars, very, very constricted. But because of 
blockbusting because of new suburbanization, by 1960, this large swath of West Baltimore is a majority, um, really hyper-segregated African-American. And this is the same time that Brown and Balto, that uh, Brown v. Board of Education, 1954, uh, comes, becomes the law of the land. Baltimore is very proud that it integrated its schools, but in fact, the way that it did that did not result in much whole-scale integration. It, a lot of it was by choice. Um, African-American families had to make the move to move into a majority white school and vice versa. Some families tried it. It was not, it was not, did not make for an integrated school system. So um, a lot of these kinds of issues uh, came to a fore in 1968. Um, we did some research about this in, um, in 2008, leading up to the 40th anniversary of the, of the unrest of 1968 that followed the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. And we asked people what life was like before the unrest, in 1968, and after the unrest. And I see that one of our informants is in the audience right here. It's nice to, it's nice to see you. Um, so we had a lot of people from a lot of walks of life who came to um, give us interviews. All of the interviews are transcribed here on, on this website. So here's what was going on before 1968 that our inner informants talk about. First of all, um, this is the census. What the census says is the height of population in Baltimore. It probably people now think that it probably was in 1946, right at the end of World War II. Um, right after World War II, uh, people started leaving. So we might have had as many as a million two hundred and fifty thousand people here in um, 1946. Then people start leaving, and as you can see, population drops every single decade after 1950. It doesn't start with the unrest of 1968. Another big factor is that in the last half of the 20th century, Baltimore lost 100,000 manufacturing jobs. So a lot of those people were leaving town to go and look for other pla look for jobs other places, and that leaves a lot of vacant housing. So again, uh, flight middle class flight white flight did not start um, in Baltimore in 1968. This is pretty amazing to me. Um, another custom of Baltimore. This is from 1964. Uh, so we're not in the 20s anymore, but you still have designations of where colored people can look for housing. And so that is still going on. We hadn't had the Fair Housing Act of 1968 yet, but that is still going on um, in the 1960s. So population is, leave, is, uh, is dropping. You have an increasing vacant houses. You still have a restriction on where African Americans can live. And we found this article, actually, I found it in the microfilm room, on microfilm, right here in this library, um, from the Evening Sun, 1967, Thomas Edsel writes about Pennsylvania Avenue and says, it's been declining for a generation. This is before the unrest of 1968. So yes, some businesses in Pennsylvania Avenue were affected, but already in 1967, there, were, there was crime, a lot of the businesses had closed. A lot of those live venues had switched to movies. Um, and you also had drug activity already along Pennsylvania Avenue in 1967. So the unrest occurs in, um, after Martin Luther King's assassination. Uh, he's assassinated on a Thursday night, April the 4th. And our unrest begins here Saturday um, evening. It continues for almost a week. Um, six people were killed and a thousand businesses were affected. Uh, the, the businesses were in about 15 business districts across the city, so many more business districts, and the downtown was not affected at all. Some people think, oh, well, that's when the department stores closed in Baltimore, downtown Baltimore. No, that wasn't, that wasn't it. They, those department stores were not affected by the unrest, and also a lot of them had already created suburban outposts by 1968. 
Um, so we created a, an anthology based on uh, some of the oral histories and also some of the papers that were given at our community conference that talked about the results of, oh yes, and you made that mosaic, didn't you? Yes, <laughs> the, art, the arts um, that's on there is the mosaic that's now at the 33rd Street Y. Um, and we talked about, yes, they, um, we did have to call it riots because our publisher wanted us to call it riots. Uh, so the riots occurred, and then what happened afterwards? We were very interested in the rebirth. So we just we investigated some of the institutions that came up in Baltimore afterwards. Uh, Strong City Baltimore used to be Greater Homewood Community Corporation. This year they changed their name, but they were established in the wake of the unrest of 1968. The Neighborhood Design Center was also established after that, and the famous Baltimore City Fair, which was much beloved around here, um, um, was a response to that unrest. In the interim, we've also seen investment in the west side, especially along Pennsylvania Avenue. So this might look familiar to you, part of the Main Street program, um, murals, uh, facade, um, aid, new businesses, the Avenue Bakery, delicious sweet potato rolls, new housing, uh, also a recognition of the history and the historical significance of Billy Holiday along the avenue. Uh, the Arch Social Club in 2010 uh, had not been renovated yet. The Arch Social Club in 2013, a complete renovation. Uh, that's right at the corner of Pennsylvania and North Avenue. Uh, the Arch Social Club was not touched in the unrest, and neither was the library right across the street from the CVS. We also have different uh, nonprofits doing good work there. The Center for Urban Families is one standout that brings uh, returning citizens into the community, job training, uh, a whole wealth of social services there too. And yet, these same neighborhoods erupted in, 19, in 2015. And so we really need to ask why, and that's why you are all here tonight listening to a discussion of the history because I think we're all invested in figuring out why this happened and trying to correct those problems. So here's one reason. I found these on Zillow yesterday. Um, this is a row house in Hamden, a traditionally white neighborhood, a white mill town settled by people from uh, the rural south. Here's a two-bedroom, one-bath house. It sold this earlier this summer for $182,000. Here's a row house that I think looks a lot the same. It's on Woodwork Avenue, which is south of the park in a traditionally black neighborhood. Three bedrooms, one bath, 1,300 square feet. They are asking $8,000 for that house. It's in foreclosure, but they're asking $8,000 for it. Um, also, as all those um, jobs left the city, uh, new economic opportunities opened up. They had been in existence since the 60s, but certainly the drug trade um, operates in our city. We are all aware of that. And um, the war on drugs means that there are more opportunities for police to stop people in neighborhoods that are, that are um, people who are in the drug trade and have more um, police interactions. So here's some maps that are, these are going to be hard for you to see, I'm sorry, uh, but this is Freddie Gray's neighborhood, Santan Winchester, and all of these maps it's outlined in this black. So you can see in 2015, here are the arrests in our city. It almost goes so close to the redlining maps. Um, this is the officer-involved shootings in 2000, from 2013 to 2015. Here is the hypersegregation. 80 to 100 percent of people in this neighborhoods are, are black. In this neighborhood, um, in this map, it'll show you the percentage that's unemployed and looking for work. That doesn't even count the people who have given up looking for work. Uh, this, mean, this is 17 percent in the, in, the, in the big red areas. And then here are the vacant lots over here. And here are the vacant buildings. You can see ghosts of all of those maps that we've been looking at uh, throughout the evening. 
Um, so finally, I would just like for us to think about these customs of Baltimore that we've been reviewing and how they weren't always customs of Baltimore. Baltimore developed those customs. And I'm hoping that when this young man is older, we will not be sitting here 50 years from now and he'll be saying, why did these neighborhoods erupt again? Didn't this happen in 2015? Didn't this happen in 68? Um, you're here tonight because you think that there's got to be a better way for us to live together. And I am so happy that you came out to hear this history. And I'm very eager to hear your questions and your comments about this situation. Thank you. If you have a question, we'd like for you to uh, step up to the microphone to ask it. We're taping this program um, so it can be podcast from the library's website. So we want to hear your questions as well as Dr. Nix's answer. I'd also like to ask you to please make your que please ask a question uh, and keep your comments brief. Thank you. I just want to say I really enjoyed your talk, and um, I know you couldn't have covered everything that related to this in the talk, but I wanted to um, get your um, response to the fact that a lot of uh, federal housing policies helped white families move into the suburbs and helped subsidize their, their housing, which created wealth that black families didn't get an opportunity to create as well. Right, so a lot of that happens with the FHA. The FHA um, promoted single-family homes that were on big lots. They did not like row houses. And so that's going to hurt all of Baltimore City. Um, and, and they're using maps similar to the redlining maps. And absolutely, they're going to create wealth for families who are able to move out into the suburbs and, uh, and leaving the loss of wealth in those neighborhoods where the housing stock is older, the housing stock is often filled with lead paint, um, and you're not going to be able to get an insured loan uh, to, to sell that or even loan to do home improvements to it. So it's just the housing stock is going to decline, continue to decline. Hello. Um, I have two questions, if that's okay. Sure. The first involves, you mentioned that Hopkins had segregated wards. Yeah. Uh, there were hospitals that were white or black hospitals. Is, is that right? And at what point did, did the hospital actually accept blacks and, and segregate them? Well, Provident Hospital was the hospital that black physicians could practice in, and it was located um, on Division Street in um, West Baltimore. So that was a hospital that served black patients and also had black doctors that, could, that were, had uh, privileges there. Um, so, you know, I'm not exactly sure that... The, the dates that other hospitals would have merged, but, you know, it's going to be after the Civil Rights Acts. And uh, so I would say the 60s. Somebody here might know. Taylor might know. I just I know. know that someone said when they were very young, they had told, we were talking, and when they were young, they were injured. And he said the nearest black hospital was, in other words, the nearest hospital that he was allowed to go to. Right. Was, Da, 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 you know, and, right. And so there, you know, there are many tragic stories like that mm -hmm. about when you couldn't make it to a hospital, especially in the in the South. Uh, but and you know, so other people, hospital historians, might know better than I about how that worked in Baltimore. But Provident Hospital was a black hospital. And then, if my if I may, my second question: uh, You mentioned redlining, and you mentioned an organization. Was it? Home, and the, I couldn't tell what it was. Yeah, you? sorry. So it's the Home Owners Loan Corporation. Was that a private? It's a government. It's a government. Oh, it's it's part of the okay. New Deal. And I can get into the weeds with okay. this, but um, so so these these maps, which are so striking, um, they appear. Uh, actually, a, a professor discovers them in the 1970s, and a, a professor at Columbia. And he says, oh, my goodness, this is a, a conspiracy that's been kept from us. You know, those redlining maps are, um, so where are they, um, have been used by the federal government to really hurt cities. And, and this is an idea, and it's still out there. And it is, in fact, 
true because the FHA did use these red line, use similar redlining maps. The actual HOLC redlining maps weren't distributed widely. I can never figure out the mechanism, like, how was the federal government telling private banks that they couldn't lend to people? Like, how is that exactly working? It makes sense to me with the FHA because they insure the loans, and they can say, I'm not going to insure a loan in a certain neighborhood. Um, these HOLC maps were actually scholars think now were a reflection of the practices, the customs of Baltimore that were already going on, and they, that's what they were asking people all over, all over the country to tell them, and so this is a, more of a reflection of practices that were already in place as opposed to a prescriptive, you cannot lend to these places. That's what it becomes with the FHA. And, and that was also a continuation of the question, because I understand that in 1910, the mayor of Baltimore redlined right out of the mayor's office. So would that have just continued and then the federal government it says, picked oh, up here's on it. where they you're right. They would have changed it. They would have adapted. They would have just right. But they're right in. but they're talking to the they're talking to those people in power and saying, where are you willing to lend and where are you not? Right. A wonderful talk that you made. My oh, um, my life pretty much parallels the story you told from 1940 until now. My father came here from Virginia, and I'm going to be short. He went to work at Bethlehem Steel. He couldn't read or write. Had a wonderful job. I lived in a small enclave in Baltimore County called Turner Station. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wonderful place. We had everything we needed. In 1959, on the east side of Baltimore, on Elwood Avenue, which is where we moved, a black person bought a house in the 1300 block of North Elwood Avenue. Mm -hmm. Within a year, the 13, 14, and 1500 block of Elwood was all black. Mm. Many of the white families moved out without telling their neighbors that they were selling their house, and people were very shocked. The good thing about that is those houses which my parents bought for $8,000, are now valued between $125,000 and $150,000. Very quickly, uh, I graduated from Morgan in 1960, and I went into service. I came back in 66, and in 68, of course, we had the riots. Uh, I happened to be on Monument Street going home when the first episode broke out at a couple of the jewelry stores on Monument Street. At that time, we didn't have the iPhones and the instant right. communication, but the word got around and that started it. I'll close by saying in my lifetime, and I'm now 78, I believe that the big problem is not that we hate each other, the big problem is our greed for money because many of these things, the redlining, the inability to let us move into certain communities made money for people. The same thing is happening now with our banks. They are finding ways to make money without serving the original purpose for which they were developed. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I guess my question sort of dovetails actually with the gentleman's comments. Um, I was having a conversation recently with someone who does some uh, modest developing in the, in the city and, and development in the city, and uh, he shared with me something that was a little surprising to me, um, that it's regular practice, according to this gentleman, for um, banks and underwriters essentially to review the current planning maps, Baltimore planning maps, which show distressed properties, um, and to use those uh, planning maps, which are really designed in order to spur 
uh, development and also to help the city identify areas that really ought to be invested in and mm. um, a- and actually are use those in sort of an insidious way uh, a- and in determining whether or not to underwrite a loan in those particular areas. I'm curious if you're aware of that phenomenon. Is that true? And to what extent does that uh, really um, uh, equate to a kind of modern, you know, current day form of redlining? Right. I I don't know about that practice um, completely. Um, I, I know that when I do these talks, oftentimes real estate agents stand up and say, you know, this is uh, this is history. This is against all of our ethical training. Two of my students are, are realtors, and we just had this discussion today about about ways that that some people go through the ethical training, and yet you know these practices continue. This is anecdotal, but I know that when we bought our house in Union Square, we had agreed on a price with the seller, and the bank wouldn't underwrite that. I mean, the bank said, you can't buy your house for that. I mean, we felt, I don't know if we were being redlined or not, but that was the year 2000 in Union Square, a distressed community, I'm sure they thought at the time, um, and, um, and they weren't going to give us a loan for that. So I also I'm, noticed the color is still red, by the way, when I went and looked at those maps. Yeah, right, right. I'm sh- right. Thanks for your presentation. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I thought you did a marvelous job of outlining the policies and practices that have led to the conditions that resulted in the rioting, the redlining, and, and many of the other things. And the young man pointed out how the suburbs were subsidized, not just the Levitt towns and other places like that that allowed folks to move freedom of movement, but also the uh, interstate highway system in the 50s allowed right, right. people to live in the suburbs and then still come to the city to work. The results of those segregated have lead to a set of conditions. Lack of education, lack of access to quality education. You pointed out the health issues that result from it. Um, Jobs are clearly not there. Uh, Inadequate housing. This is a copy of the National Advisory Commission report on the 1968 riots. Mm. We've focused on Baltimore here, but it is just a microcosm for what is going on in many communities around the country. Sure. One of the differences is after the 60s, we had a president and a Congress, and there was a certain public will to try to address it. For a few years, there were programs put in place, and some people managed to even escape that. The current conditions do not allow for that. Hmm. What beyond identifying the causes and the conditions can be done in this environment to address those issues, because as long as those issues remain, it's then when you have a confrontation between police and a resident of that community, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when those types of things will happen again. So, just right. like, yeah, what, what, well, what, that's what the question of the day, right? I mean, we all, <laughs> we, we need, I'm, I'm a historian, and so I try to do my part mm-hmm. of, of telling the history, and I think that if more people understand this history of our city, then they're going to see neighborhoods and in a different in a different way. And that's what I'm hoping that you know I'm I'm talking to different kind of groups about this. And I also think that it's it's wonderful to have a room full of people that are willing to come out and spend an evening thinking about these issues. And I think that that was what happened after 1968 in Baltimore. Uh, it was kind of the elephant in the room in a lot of ways. And when we started our our investigation, and Jessica Elfenbein was the person who really thought that this was something that we should do, um, and uh, sh- she got a lot of pushback. And people said, "Don't e- why are you even going there? That there are no winners in that story, you know." And I, but I think that the more you investigate trouble like that, um, the, the, the more you are able to really understand the causes of it. And I hope that this is just the beginning of those kind of investigations about what happened in 2015. Again, I commend your research. If I can just have one brief follow-up. Have you heard of any initiatives at all moving in, in that direction as a result of your research and the people 
in, in Baltimore? Talk. Yes, in Baltimore. Um, well, I mean, there's one Baltimore that's 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 working on things. Um, there, uh, I, I think you're so right to point out the young activists. It's so exciting to see all the uh, leaders for a beautiful struggle and uh, City Block. Uh, working to try to get the voices of the youth um, into part into this conversation, so I think that's really encouraging. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, good evening. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation this evening. I wanted to comment a little on. I was surprised by the neutral neutrality of the presentation. <laughs> right? I think that I was surprised, and I missed the first ten minutes, so maybe you gave a disclaimer. But um, although even the description for the evening highlighted how you were going to address the presence of structural racism and white privilege, um, I think I'd like to hear you speak a little bit directly to those points as uh, this isn't just customs that right. came about, right? These were purposeful plans when you combine race and prejudice and power and how they manifested themselves in a way that um, was government sanctioned discrimination and we see the results of it still manifested today. So I'd like you to make those connections. Yeah, thank you so much for that because um, I did, when I found that quote from the library, I did go with customs and I think you're right, it muted the importance of that. I mean, if you, um, I work with Dr. Neil Friedlander on, on these issues and a lot of the Aspen Institute um, racial equity group and one of the things that they always say is that systems are created, our systems create the outcomes that they want to create. And this is what's happened here, is that government programs came together to create a situation in the inner cities that is exactly what we're dealing with today. And that, you're absolutely right, it wasn't an accident. It was deliberate from, you know, all of the, especially the residential policies. Uh, one thing I didn't talk about that some that I sometimes do is uh, a really great article by Emily Lieb that's in our anthology, and she talks about the federal highway system and how it's targeting certain neighborhoods um, and saying the highways are going to go here, and then they change the plan and they say no, the highways are going to go here, and so. If you've stopped investing in a, in a certain neighborhood, if you've stopped investing in your property because you think the highway, the city is going to take that for the federal highway system, and then it changes, that's going to be whole swaths of the city are, are just written off, and then people are still expected to live there. So that's, that's another way that, um, that hammers home exactly your point, that these were, that these were deliberate policies. Absolutely. The customs were more of the segregation about which stores decided to do what, and, and you know, those, were, those were not the government policies. But you're exactly right. The whole structure is, is one of, of structural racism, mostly through government programs. Hi. Thank you very much for the talk. Eric, sir, a couple questions I have. Uh, I mean, I realize the issues are giant in terms of economic justice, prisons for profit, et cetera. But looking forward in a way, uh, Corey McRae, who's a new councilman, was on the uh, uh, midday show and talking about apprenticeship programs and mm -hmm. how he worked his way up, I think as a plumber or electrician, he owns three houses or something like this, and how that system infected his life in a very powerful, positive way. So we see a lot of empty houses, a need for housing, good housing in our city. And I, so if you could comment a little bit on this, how to, how to move forward in a better way. And second question, the mayor, the mayor, mayoral race. I mean, I think we have some great public schools, School of Public Health, University of Baltimore, looking at issues in our city. It seems like this should be a focus for the mayoral campaign. And if University of Baltimore could hold a debate with the candidates and place this issue front and center about housing with you organizing some questions. I think it could be a great help in moving our city in a good direction. 
That's a great idea. I mean, we have a, a College of Public Affairs uh, at University of Baltimore. They create, their um, one center creates the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance, and so they're, they're already, you know, involved in a lot of these issues, and it would be a really appropriate place for that forum. The apprenticeship idea, I think, is a great idea, and um, I think the Center for Urban Families is doing a, an apprenticeship program. Does anybody here know that for sure? Uh, that's, my, that's my understanding. Is that what... Jobs Opportunities Task Force, and uh, so I think that's uh, that's. Uh, I think a lot of people see that need of the vacant houses and underemployment, and would love to put those two things together and solve that solve that issue. Hello, Hi. Um, very much enjoyed your discussion tonight. Um, I just wanted to maybe sort of ask a hypothetical situation um, as probably we all have seen before, a line of vacant homes is readily seen in a lot of distressed neighborhoods in the city. And maybe in a hypothetical situation, if going in and rehabbing each of these blocks, would this m maybe bring a more united community or would you foresee the a history of primarily a black neighborhood or primarily a white neighborhood still exists within these maybe uh, long histories of communities, even if the homes had received a, a decent rehab. Yeah, sure. I mean, we all know that there are a lot of issues with the vacant housing in Baltimore, and a lot of is uh, the titles to figuring out who owns the properties. Um, maybe you all can remind me of the name. There wasn't there a group of young people who decided to do just that probably about 10 years ago? They were uh, like, a, which one? Tech Bolt, yes, right. So they, they, they looked at a whole bunch of neighborhoods, and they were going to buy a block in, in one neighborhood, and I think they ended up along, um, well, in the same neighborhood in uh, Old West Baltimore along maybe maybe even McCullough Street. Um, so how did that work, that, that plan? I think they had, I, I think it did not, it was not a rousing success. That was my understanding. Is that true? No tech ball people here? Um, I, I, and I can't remember exactly what happened, but they did, they did face some difficulties. Although, you know, it's a, it's a good idea. It's sometimes really hard to secure an entire block. I think the problem was they, they had to critical Right. I think that's right. Yeah. So which neighborhoods in Baltimore are the least segregated? How did they get that way, and can we propagate that? Yeah, great question. We can all, if you know uh, one, I mean, I live in uh, Sewebo. I live in southwest Baltimore, and uh, our, we have an integrated neighborhood. We have an integrated neighborhood association um, where um, Remington, Lauraville, Patterson Park, Reservoir oh, Reservoir Hill, Irvington. Irvington. There's some. <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't. I, I think. Um, I think Baltimore is lucky with our housing stock. I mean, I think people, you know, really treasure our historic houses and want those neighborhoods to thrive and don't want to see huge blocks of houses bulldozed, and 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 want to want to make viable neighborhoods within the city, and so I guess that's how it happens. I don't. Yeah. Good evening, and thank you for your re uh, great research. Um, I just want to uh, make mention of something that 45 years ago, I was not in this country, and um, one of the selling points uh, that brought me to Baltimore City was the idea that this was a, a city of neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And I look back at what has happened and uh, the talk that you just gave, and it seems to be uh, that uh, that phrase might actually be a code word for a city of segregation or a city of segregated neighborhoods. Um, so that's something to think about. Uh, maybe what we're using abroad as um, a yeah. way to publicize the city might actually uh, be uh, the undergirding of a, a philosophy that is uh, one of segregation. Um, it's ironic, isn't it? Yeah, and it's, uh, it's, and it's um, actually civic leaders thought that creating neighborhoods with names in the wake of 1968 was going to make people who lived in those neighborhoods 
more um, protective and take more pride in those areas. So actually, of course there were neighborhoods, but there was a real push to name neighborhoods, figure out borders uh, after 1968, and it's um, in order to try to make people feel like they, they were part of a place that they wouldn't want to destroy that place. And, and so, as you point out, it, it might have, it, that, the psychology of it might have worked in just the opposite way. Uh, okay, just uh, one more thing. Uh, in fact, uh, tonight I, I invited my, um, I teach at uh, um, Baltimore City College, and um, I invited some of my students to come here tonight and uh, listen to what you have to say, uh, because we're really looking at what happened in the aftermath of this uh, Baltimore uh, riots and uh, trying to analyze those things in class and find out uh, what we can do, what, what happens. In fact, the question that they're supposed to be working on is to uh, look at the question, what happens now? What's next? And um, I would have liked to hear you talk a little bit more about where the trajectory should be going, uh, because uh, some of the talk that you, some of the uh, things that you mentioned here talked about the effects of the uh, housing market, uh, the mm -hmm. bankers, the, the mortgage lenders. Um, we can talk about where we want this thing to go and what people can do to contribute. But without those lenders involved to make sure that we're moving in the right direction, because they are the ones who ultimately are going to fund the lending for this right. housing uh, issue. So if they're not involved in the discussion, if they're not at the table, then um, we're just whistling in the wind, aren't we? Well, you're right, and, and thank you for the work that you do at City. I'm a huge fan of City College, and your students are some of the most active um, young people who are in this discussion right now. Uh, City Block, I think, is, you know, started at City. I, um, it's interesting because some of the inner city neighborhoods, like Bolton Hill, that really maintained their value did so through private um, pooling of funds when banks would not lend to people mortgages neighbors in Bolton Hill had funds that they would lend to people who wanted to buy those houses and so that um, you know that's working outside of the system it certainly has potential for pitfalls uh, but it's a creative way to get funding to uh, those neighborhoods that uh, that the banks wouldn't the other banks wouldn't necessarily lend to. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I say one more yeah, sure. Thank you very much for your presentation. I enjoyed it deeply. And I was an urban and regional planning minor, so this is okay. ringing a bell. I had a professor in my classes describe cities as a blueberry donut after the 50s. You saw blacks move in and whites moved out. Now all of a sudden I'm seeing the opposite of that. You're seeing cities like San Francisco, like Portland, even DC especially, just it being an hour away. A majority of white individuals are moving in and now blacks are being pushed out. I'm a little unnerved at the progression of cities. What is possibly a good stopping point for cities to keep that diversity within neighborhoods? Because mm -hmm. I'm sure Federal Hill, Fells Point, where else, Canton, Mount Vernon at one point were those same Irvingtons, those same different neighborhoods. Since I'm new here, I'm not completely familiar with them. But are charter schools a possibility of keeping diverser crowds in cities? What are some of the steps that cities are taking to keep them here? Well, there are, there's certainly charter schools in, in Baltimore City, and I think that was one of the reasons that charter schools were started, to try to keep families in the city. Um, I think that... Um, you know, talking about gentrification is always a minefield. <laughs> and I lived in San Francisco for a while, and the Mission District is one of the places that, you know, has changed completely. Um, and now all the high-tech moguls want to live there, and it used to be a very affordable Latino neighborhood. Now there's actually a store that sells taxidermied mice doing different things there. I mean, that just seems to me... I, 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 I don't think Baltimore is there yet, you know? And, and so I, I, I think there's a danger of equating any kind of economic activity with, with gentrification. And I know that we don't want to push people out. And you're so right. We've seen that uh, in, so many, in so many places. Um, 
but it's, it, you know, Baltimore has 16,000 vacant houses. Um, so I think maybe if we could figure out a way to implement one of these, you know, apprenticeship programs and blocking to, uh, pooling money to make lend, lending to kind of preserve some of these houses, I actually think that Baltimore... Baltimoreans know the dangers of gentrification, do not want to create a city like that, and are going to really try hard to come up with creative situ um, solutions so that to prevent that, because we do value so much the diversity of the city and, and want that to, to remain economically and racially. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, well, I mean, I mean, it goes back to the first point about money, right? Like, if there's money to be made, people aren't going to aren't going to aren't going to do that. I'm just, you know, I, I love this city and I love its quirkiness and I love its diversity and I think that people who live here, um, you know, have to love that too. And I've never made a lot of money, and so I don't know how that works. And so I guess that that's that's my end naivete. So. <laughs> No, no, no. I appreciate it. You're right. You're right. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks very much to Professor Nix. We really appreciate it. So in closing, I would just say thank you again for coming. I think all of you have something to offer, whether it's housing or trying to keep uh, police accountable and improving police community relations, trying to stop huge levels of incarceration, trying to keep our kids in school and feeling really supported and valued. There's so many ways that all of us uh, can contribute and I think follow up on this history so we don't see it, another pattern of it. Thanks very much. <laughs>